It is Tuesday, April 11th at 7.33 p.m. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that all, all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Ben Holly. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. Adam, I saw you a minute ago. Did I lose you? I'm here. Oh, you're there you are. Thank you. Um, assisting us from the town, we have Colleen Ralston, the zoning assistant. Here. Good evening. Uh, appearing on behalf of uh, 106 Mount Vernon Street, uh, we have Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor. Uh, appearing for 39 Sunnyside Avenue, uh, Brendan Rock and Caitlin Santa Cruz. Yeah, we're here. Perfect. Thank you. And also, I'm uh, Diane Miller, the architect representing oh. Caitlin. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, appearing on behalf of 90 Brantwood Road, uh, Rennie Sloan and John Swansinger. I'm here. Rainey's here. John was unable to make Perfect. it. Um, he had so he's oh, not okay. And I'm Great. Alan Mayer, the architect. Thank uh, you. Mr. Klein, Chairman Klein, yep. I'm not appearing for the applicant. I'm appearing for the abutters on oh. 106. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Sean Snyder is here. I do see him. Yep, here. Uh, and then appearing on behalf of 11 Pine Ridge Road, Amanda and Matthew Edwards. Here. Perfect, thank you. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects. Signed into law on March 29th, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted, and the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an order of meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So the first item on our agenda, um, <clears throat> let's just say items two and three, Three, uh, both are administrative items, so I will go ahead and hold those uh, till the end so we can move along to the public hearings. Uh, before opening public hearings, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce the agenda item, I will ask the applicants to introduce themselves for themselves and make their presentation to the board. 
I will then request that members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So with that, um, I also request, because we do have a, a large number of people on, if you are uh, not currently the speaker, um, I ask you if you would please mute your line um, just to help keep the extraneous noise down. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we move on to item four on our docket, which is, uh, excuse me, on our agenda, which is docket number 3735, 106 Mount Vernon Street. This is the continuance uh, from a prior hearing. Um, I would uh, ask the applicant to uh, identify themselves and let us know what has uh, changed in the ensuing weeks. Hi, Christian. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would just like to say thank you to the uh, zoning board. Um, I know last time we met, we were able to kind of hop off of the call after a long meeting, and I appreciate that you all had to continue on with the meeting and um, also pursue some uh, research in the following weeks. Uh, yeah, not much has changed on our end. Our architect, Jenna Ellison's here, um, so she can answer any questions that pertains to the build itself. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so at the conclusion of uh, the last meeting, there were several questions that the board had um, in regards to specifically to the zoning bylaw and how they would apply to this property. Um, there are questions that needed to be addressed by the um, the zoning official for the town of Arlington, who is also the building inspector. Uh, so I had proposed those questions to him, um, and he had responded back, and the responses was shared with the applicants, but I'll go ahead and um, share them here as well. Let's see if I can do the best way to do this here. Everybody gets to look at my mail. So on the question of usable open space, uh, it was the, this pro the opinion of the zoning official is that this project is in compliance with the requirement for usable open space. There is an open area, 25 feet by 25 feet, which is partly on the ground and partly on the deck. And as is the practice of the inspectional services department, that is considered compliant. Um, so the addition of the um, the deck in the opinion of the inspectional service, of, excuse me, of the zoning official, that does not create a new nonconformity. Um, attached versus detached. This addition proposed for this project constitutes an attached building. Although the proposed condition falls between the two definitions in the bylaw, it is not connected by a wall, but it is still physically connected. There is more of a connection than an absence of a connection. Inspectional services is bound by the regulations of the town of Arlington by zoning bylaw. And in this situation, the zoning bylaw provides conflicting definition, definitions. The proposed structure does not meet the zoning bylaw definition of attached or detached. And this office was left with no option but to refer the matter um, to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, and then next is the question on setbacks. So if it's considered an attached building, the addition is not considered an accessory structure and it must comply with the setback requirements for the primary structure. If the board was to determine the structures are detached, then the proposed accessory building would follow the setback requirements for an accessory building. Uh, under building height, as an attached building, the addition is not considered an accessory structure and must comply with the height requirements for the primary structure. If the board was to determine the structures are detached, then the proposed accessory building would follow the height requirements for an accessory building. And uh, for floor area ratio, as an attached building, the addition is not considered an accessory structure and floor area ratio is not a consideration. If the board was to determine the structures are detached, then the proposed accessory building would follow the FAR requirements for an accessory building. I hope that helps to clarify some of the, the issues uh, that are before us today. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop that. Um, so what we have before us, and I don't know, um, Ms. Ellison, if you have um, the documentation on this that you would be able to share. 
Sure. Are you looking um to look at the plans right now just look, or just look at the plans, please? Sure. So I will share that. Can you see this? Yes, indeed. Yep. So I think this is um, the plan so the, that yep, we've been looking at. We'll see. Yep, perfect. So the 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 primary the first question that the board needs to make a determination on is this question of is it attached or is it detached? Um, the definition for an attached dwelling requires that it share a wall. The requirement for a detached dwelling is that it have no connection at all. But here we are connected by a deck. Um, and so it, I think it's a, it's a, this is sort of the critical question as to how we proceed with the rest of um, the rest the, the review of this project is do we, is it, is the proposed building, which is a garage with an ADU above, is that an ex a separate accessory structure or is it a part of the existing house by means of being connected by the deck at the upper level? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, in looking at this, one of the ways we can think about it is if you were going to do a Venn diagram of this, you would see that part of the space is taken up by attached, part is taken up by detached, and there's a space in the middle. And that's what happened because of the way the, of the so-called co conflicting de definitions. So there's really a third category here that's not attached. And not attached includes detached, but it also includes some things that are not detached. And one way of approaching the problem is, is to assume that the zoning ordinance, when it uses the word attached, defines it the way it's defined in the bylaw. And when it uses the word detached, it defines it the way it's used in the bylaw. And so then you have to see which which word is being used. And detached is used a lot in the bylaw. Uh, it always uses single family detached. So they, they're, they're not shy about using that word. In the ADU ordinance, they don't use that word. They only talk about attached. And if you follow the principle that until you're forced to deal with what what's in that middle, you just follow the definition that the bylaw gives to the particular word that the bylaw uses, then that may shed light on, on uh, whether, in this case, whether it's attached or not. In other words, we don't have to find out that it's either attached or detached. It, it clearly is not detached within the meaning of the bylaw, and it, but it clearly is not attached within the meaning of the bylaw either. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that leaves you with the question of what do you do when something falls in that forgotten middle? Uh, and it seems to me that the way I will look at it, I, at this point, and this doesn't answer all the questions, but the way I tend to look at it is that if the, if the bylaw if, uh, uses the word attached, it means attached, uh, and it has to have a wall. If it uses the word detached, it means it just has to be physically connected. And you look at the word that the bylaw actually uses in the first place, and you only try to deal with whether it's more like this or more like that uh, uh, in cases where you where you can't avoid it by just looking at the plain language of the, of the bylaw. So that at least gives you another way of looking at it that doesn't, that at least provides a way of reconciling a lot of the differences between the two definitions. So going by that <clears throat> interpretation, which side do you do you think this falls on? I think that it falls on the. I think that the provision that matters is the provision in the in the ADU bylaw, and also in the provision that I don't immediately have before me that says that. When it is attached, you follow all of the the side 
the, all of the dimensional requirements for the for the principal building. Uh, both of those use only the word attached, mm -hmm. and so I would interpret them as as meaning attached within the meaning of the bylaw, which is they share a wall. That would be true, even though mm -hmm. the definition of that that would be true, even though they're they're physically connected, and you would not be able to say they are not detached because de the the two definitions don't don't cleanly match each other. Mm -hmm. Is there a comment from other members of the board? Uh, Mr. Sure. Ms. Hoffman. I'm, I, I believe, inclined to agree in that the fact that they do not share a wall um seems to be to me in some ways the primary consideration here mm -hmm. mr chair mr Holly. i have one probably a question or an issue here if if this was a bigger lot, and probably a hypothetical question here, but if it were a bigger lot, two detached buildings connected through a sky bridge of some car, some kind, and to me it's a mm -hmm. connection. It's to me it's not attached the way I'm seeing it. But again, I'm not strictly speaking definition wise. But could that open up to misinterpretation there to a connector versus a attached portion, you know. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'm told that, that that exact situation happened, it was presented in the case before the uh, uh, ARB some time ago, uh, where an applicant was claiming that uh, a two buildings, one of which was all residential, and one of which was uh, all commercial, uh, were mixed use because they had a skyway between the two of them. And and they, and they therefore constituted only one building. Uh, and that was resolved in, or was abandoned, I believe, by the applicant after a considerable controversy. But the situation that Mr. Holy raises is a situation that comes up, and it comes up as a result of the potential overreading of the word of the literal meaning of the word detached. Obviously, with the definition of attach, where they had to share a wall, that would that issue would not have arisen. Arisen. Other thoughts. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. So I tend to agree with the analysis so far. And I I look at it and I guess I have a couple of questions from the plan. So this building itself is entirely in the backyard. Is that correct? It is within the backyard, yes. The, and so, and so, then in terms of the accessory structure that we would need um, in terms of uh, setbacks, I just had it up. I apologize. I kind of lost it. But um, we're what are we dealing with in terms of the setbacks? Strictly speaking, and I'm not even talking about a garage here. I'm just talking about an accessory structure. So we're talking about six feet side and six feet rear. I am. And I'm I'm um, navigating to that. That's a, that's on page so, five da five dash fifteen. Yep. Just landed there. Yeah. So the minimum requirement setback for an accessory building in a garage structure is twenty five feet from the front, six from the side six from the rear and and because the plan itself i think i can see it it's just a little small 
So do we meet those, uh, certainly the 25 feet, obviously, but to the side, is the smallest dimension um, six feet to the side? It is. Okay. And then it's clearly more than that toward the rear? It is nine, nine foot nine. Okay. And then we come up, and, and I'm just trying to frame this to be able to process this aside from the question of definition of attached and detached, mm -hmm. because there's also um, 5.4.27, section seven, and that provides a little bit different guidance in terms of setbacks, right, for garages? Correct. And so, and that's dependent upon the uh, construction type. Correct, because you would be encroaching so close to the side lot line, the construction needs to be fireproof, so it can no longer be wood framed. It has to be, as most garages you see are, would be, you know, concrete block. So if we were looking at this uh, 5.4.27 then, and they met the type one and two construction, et cetera, then you could be zero, zero, right? So a garage could be constructed without regard to the setbacks as long as it meets the construction type. If it was garage by itself, yeah. So, so if it was, and I know that now we sort of, we, we kind of start swerving back into attached and detached uh, mm -hmm. where we have that conversation. But the other question I think I have is that I know that in the email you sent after your discussion with Mike Champa, mm -hmm. you know, there was some reference to the, um, let me just see this, the fact of the open space, including the deck. Yeah. So, so the placement of the building, which the ADU building right now, leaves the open space intact. Is that also accurate? So we would need you know, dimensional verification that that is the case, um, to, that there is 25 feet. The way it's drawn right now, it's a very good question as to whether they do in fact have 25 feet by 25 feet as it's drawn. Um, if they were to, you know, if they were to, if the, if the project did not include usable open space, that was a minimum 25 feet by 25 feet, then that would be a new non-conformity requiring a variance. Right. And that was actually what I was leading to. Mm -hmm. So the question as to whether or not as presented, there is a need for a variance. And if, as you're saying, it needs to be clarified, I think we have, we mm -hmm. absolutely have to do that. Absolutely. And those are sort of my questions. That's what I wanted to know to help me sort of process this a little bit further. Mm -hmm. So with um, the deck area in being included for the usable open space, we do have the 25 by 25. Um, and I could either like scale it off the survey or put the dimensions on this um, mm -hmm. or have the surveyor do it if that's the yeah. best way to do it. We would just need final verification that, that in fact that does exist. Okay. So my sense sort of from the discussion before the board, the board is um, of the opinion that these, these are in fact two structures that are connected by a deck, but that does not mean that they are um, attached per se uh, under the definition of the bylaw. So in that case, we would need to consider them as two separate structures um, for the conversation going forward at this 
everyone in agreement on that, that that's what the board is considering? Yes, for me. Okay. Me. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, uh, going back to uh, the questions that I had, had earlier, um, so the the setbacks for the required accessory dwelling unit, um, as an accessory structure, it now falls under a different category than the main building. So it mm -hmm. has to be at least six feet from the side lot line and six feet from the rear lot line. Um, which is what is proposed here, um, excuse me, and um, needs to be at least 25 from the front, which it obviously is. It needs to be located in the rear yard, which it is. Um, the next question uh, then is the question of building height. Um, and in the table of dimensions, um for max for in the residential districts maximum height in the r0 r1 for a single family detached dwelling it's 35 feet for other permitted structure it is also listed as 35 feet but i wasn't sure if there was a different height in the r1 specifically so in a, but an accessory structure greater than 80 square feet in private garages which is what this would be because it is not a, it's not an other primary structure. Um, the maximum building height is 20 feet with a maximum height of two stories. Um, so we would need to, that would need to be verified that the building is no higher than 20 feet. Um, so um, we are planning to, um, reduce the pitch of the roof um, to make mm -hmm. sure that the height is um, 20 feet from the average grade. Um, so we have those documents um, I can show you um, right here. Um, so by changing the pitch from a seven um, to a six, mm -hmm. we would reduce it by a foot, um, which would conform. Okay, but it would not change the height of the walls. It would just change the height of the ridge. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, I think I have a building section here. Um, <clears throat> so we're planning to do that. Okay. And what's the in what's the interior height of the of the apartment? Um, we have nine foot six um, for the wall height, um, and then a little bit lower where the pitch of the roof comes down. So eight eight foot wall here. Okay. And what's the height of the garage? Um, I believe it's seven foot four. I don't have a dimension on there, but um, basically trying to match the basement level, um, so that the Basically, the decks have to, you know, the deck has to connect the two floors. Right. Um, and then just trying to get a little bit more height um, interior um, versus, you know, the attic space. Okay. And then <clears throat> for the floor area ratio as an attached building addition. Um, so FAR does apply. So the way that, uh, so, but there's not an FAR related to garages, uh, to accessory structures, excuse me, and not to single family detached either. So FAR is not a consideration. And what is the floor area of the proposed building? 
Um, so the ADU, I believe, is 520 square feet. This is not an addition, so it is not considered a large addition because it is not increasing the gross floor area of a building because it is a separate structure. Okay. And then as a the request for an accessory dwelling unit, if it is within I'm just scrolling through my copy of the zoning bylaw. Dwelling units. Accessory building, uh, accessory dwelling unit may be located in an accessory building, which accessory building shall not constitute a principal or main building by the incorporation of the accessory dwelling unit, provided that if such accessory building is located within six feet of a lot line, then such accessory dwelling unit shall be allowed only if the Board of Appeals, acting pursuant to Section 33, grants a special permit upon its finding. The creation of such accessory dwelling unit is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the use of such accessory building as a private garage or other allowed use. So the board does not need to make an, a separate finding on the accessory dwelling unit because it is not within six feet of the side lot line. Okay, and then back to the, to the deck itself. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Uh, just before we go there, in terms of the actual um, accessory dwelling unit provision, yeah. um, I just want to confirm because it's it gives the um, maximum of 900 square feet or uh, one half of the floor area of the principal dwelling, whichever mm -hmm. is less or smaller. So I, I just want to confirm that the proposed um, you know, space for that dwelling unit is in fact within those parameters. So the existing gross floor area is listed as 1,980 square feet. Okay, so we're well within that. Okay. We are well within that. Okay, thanks. And just to confirm, um, with Ms. Allison, the proposed gross floor area on the um, on the dimensional information sheet that in, that is basically the summation of the existing building plus the accessory building. Correct? There's yes. not a separate addition to the main building. Yep, um, okay. and that is basically doesn't include um, the garage space, but partial of the entry right. and then the ADU. Okay. Let's see, scrolling to the gross floor section on gross floor area. Um, so this is section five three twenty two gross floor area. Um, So for the purposes of by a lot of following areas of buildings are to be included in the calculation of gross floor area, which includes parking garage, except as excluded below, 
and it has excluded areas used for accessory parking or off street loading purposes. So um, going back and forth with that, um, a gar the garage area that is the area of the garage that is used for parking is not included in the calculation. So the area that's dedicated to the stair for accessing the second floor would need to be included in the calculation of gross floor area, um, but would not be included in the calculation for the accessory dwelling unit because it's not a part of the unit. <clears throat> Okay. And then uh, just going back to the question of decks. So projections into minimum yards, this is section 539. Unenclosed steps, decks, and the like, which do not project more than 10 feet in the front yard or more than five feet in the side yard beyond the line of the foundation wall may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district in which the structure is built unenclosed steps, deck, and the like, which do not project more than 10 feet into the required rear yard and are not closer to the lot line than half the size of the required yard may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district. Um, and then further, porches, deck, steps, and landings in the required setback are not considered to be within the foundation wall and may not be enclosed, extended, or built upon except by special permit. Um, so with that, the, the proposed decks as indicated here, um, the required side yard setback is five feet, uh, excuse me, is 10 feet. So half that distance would be five feet. So the deck needs to be set five feet from the side yard line. And then the uh, required rear yard setback, um, would normally be 25 feet, but because the lot is shallower, um, that distance um, is 19 feet. And so half of that being nine and a half feet and the deck is, is 14 feet. So it is not closer than half the, the required rear yard. So the reason I go through all that now is a lot of this now with the determination that this is a, not an attached structure, um, a lot of this is allowable by right under the zoning bylaw. Um, and, and just sort of going through trying to determine exactly what at this stage, what aspects of this project are we required to make a finding upon? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'm, I'm I'm, I have a sort of a question on FAR to, to go back yep. to. There isn't any separate FAR requirement for the accessory st structure. Um, and and for the single family either, right? So that's, that's the reason why it is that that we treat this as a non, as zero. Um, I guess mm. the other question has to do with lot coverage and the tabulation that uh, we've seen, the lot coverage under the proposal is not, is left blank. And that's a, an issue that has been raised by the abutters and, mm. uh, and I haven't looked up to see exactly what the lot coverage is what is required. I, or I did look it up, but I don't have it on my screen. 35% is the maximum. And, but we, I, I guess I don't know what the, they say that Ms. Ellison can probably clear this up. As I recall, it said that the, the current lot coverage is 17%. And it looks like that shouldn't get up to 35% with the uh, new structure, but I'm not sure whether that's true or not and, and, and would like to have a calculation on that. Yep, um, so I just didn't remember to fill that in, um, but um, so right now the lot is 4,731 square feet. Um, so 35% of that um, 
would be 1,656 square feet. Um, and our addition or the ADU plus the decks um, and the dwelling are 1,678 square feet. So we're at 35.46%. So we could very easily get that down to um, the 35% allowed. Okay. Um, and then reviewing the some of the comments that we had last time, um, there were concerns by the um, abutting neighbor on the the right side of the property, which is um, the side that the deck is closest to, about the the proximity of the deck uh, to that side yard, and um, would. Uh, certainly, I think it would be, if you were to be looking to take an area out of the deck, that that would be a be a place you may want to look for that. Um, and then I know that some of the downhill neighbors were specifically concerned, A, about the height of the accessory dwelling unit and garage piece, uh, particularly because it is uphill from them. Um, and so any height that it has is exaggerated by the the change in elevation. Um, and they're also very concerned about the um, the flow of water from this property um, that currently heads in their direction. Um, I know that the proposal here is to add a uh, add a dry well to um, attract some of the some of the water. Um, I think it would also be very um, appropriate to. Um, to maybe explore that a little bit further to figure out if there's a if there's a better way to contain the water to really sort of keep it um, within the property, especially coming down the driveway. And then um, I don't know if you have a landscaping plan, but do you have any? I know the driveway is being expanded. Um, so are there plans specifically for a buffer between uh, the driveway and the adjacent property. We don't have one right now. Um, I know um, that the homeowner currently has like raised flower beds and things like mm -hmm. that around that side of the property, which they'll probably move, um, you know, into the yard. But I think that they're open to, you know, considering what that vegetation will look like um, in order to capture some of the water um, before it has a chance to go um, into anyone else's property. Because the, the parking bylaws, the parking section of the um, zoning bylaws do require that there, if there's park side yard parking, that there be a buffer. Okay. Um, it is slim on details as to what that buffer should entail, um, but it should be included. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any further questions or comments from the board at this time? Okay. Um, <clears throat> with that, um, so in a, in a minute, I will be opening the meeting for public comment. Uh, public Questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Uh, members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. Those you will be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair, and please remember to speak clearly. Um, anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to speak first. Um, and once all public questions or comments have been addressed, 
for um, if we if we have reached the hour, I will say of eight forty five. Um, then the public comment period will be closed. Uh, the board and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. Um, I do ask if you're if you're addressing the board. Um, there are repetitive comments. If you could just clarify those quickly, um, in the interest of time, we do have uh, three additional hearings to go through this evening, um, and we did have extensive uh, public comment at the prior hearing. Um, so, with that, I will go ahead and open the public comment period. If there's anyone who wishes to address the board, see me dial. Uh, if you're on the phone, it's star nine, and if otherwise, it is using the raise hand feature of the participant tab. Um, the chair will recognize um, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, I represent uh, the owners of 79 Situate Street and 110 Mount Vernon Street, who were at the last hearing, who were on this call. Um, I respectfully disagree with um, your interpretation of attached and detached. And it has been my experience appearing before this board and actually being a member of that of your board that the building inspectors through the years have viewed a deck in this nature as an at as attached. On, and I think 5.3.13 applies. Um, integral is important. And if you look at this deck and you look at how it connects with the properties, I would suggest to you it is attached. Now, my clients were ne never saw the plans until they uh, were posted. And I reached out to Miss Ellison to talk to her uh, but uh, about this, because, you know, it's the practice um, generally in this town that we meet with the butters and we try to reach some consensus if we can, but I didn't get a call back. Um, that's important because my clients are uh, very concerned about this project and um, there are a number of issues. Uh, you know, the accessory dwelling unit provision says that it provides for the orderly expansion of the tax base without detracting from existing character from the existing character of the affected neighborhood. And my clients believe that this does in fact uh, detract. I would also suggest to you that the Arlington residential design guidelines provide that uh, significant additions such as this should be oriented and located in a way that is consistent with the neighborhood. And side yards should reinforce the existing spacing between houses and provide enough privacy between the neighborhoods. Um, that is not what is occurring here. And why it's important that the abutters, uh, that the applicants sit down with the abutters is because whether your board grants this or whether the building inspector grants a building permit because you think relief is not gonna, uh, is not necessary, that's not gonna end it here for my clients. They are going to take the next step um, and appeal. So it makes some sense, I would suggest, that the applicants and the architect sit down with the abutters. Um, there are several others on this call that likewise are opposed to it. And I think we'll speak and come up with something that is um, respectful of the other neighbors um, because the appellate process is a very long and costly process. So that's not, we're not saying that in a threatening manner, we're saying that because they need to preserve their rights as well. They are amenable to sitting down and engaging in a uh, earnest discussion about uh, how to accomplish what they wanna do, uh, provided it is respectful of those around. So um, that, that would be what I would be saying um, on behalf of my clients here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Mr. Steve Moore. Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I, I was uh, in attendance at the last uh, meeting where there was a lot of discussion and I read a lot of the additional um, documentation and uh, letters and such. Uh, and I must say, I'm heartened at the relative balance between the people who support this and support the applicants, particularly because there's been so much community in this neighborhood, as well as the, uh, the people who are against being reasonable in stating their reasons why they're, they're not with this approach. Um, and clearly, we've heard a lot tonight about how a lot of this dances on the edge of the zoning law, laws relative to the deck, open space, 
how ADUs, which is a, a very new law in Arlington, fits into uh, small non-conforming lots, particularly one less than 5,000 square feet. And, and I'm just thinking from a, a neutral perspective, since I'm not an abutter and I'm not a neighbor, um, I would suggest that perhaps the applicants might want to consider a compromise based on the input that they've received at the meetings and with the uh, body of documentation, uh, perhaps to build the ADU uh, only on one story and give up the garage space. Now, I know that's not desirable necessarily on the, the applicant's parts. Um, however, I think a compromise probably is in order. Um, I don't, the, uh, the uh, attorney that just spoke, of course, talked about further action and, and whether or not that, that would come to pass, I really have no idea. However, um, one way to make this work would be to have more of a compromise approach between the various interested parties, which include the neighbors. I am surprised a good neighbor agreement didn't go out. Maybe it's too early in the process for that. And uh, I think a lot of this might have been um, might have been mitigated by being a little more proactive and talking to the abutters, which have some real concerns here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is uh, Ginger Tower. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, this is Scott Tower, Ginger's husband. Um, we are the right side of Butters at 110 Mount Vernon Street. I'm going to read just a little short statement because I'm not all that great about ad living here. But um, on a lot that already does not meet Arlington's minimum lot size requirements, there will be two large two story buildings a three bedroom main house in a full size apartment on an oversized garage with a deck whose square footage exceeds another 370 square feet. The footprint of the garage and apartment will be more than 75% that of the main house, all of which runs to the edges of abutting properties on all sides. The 106 Mount Vernon Street proposal runs to the edge of every zoning limit. The majority of the 106 Mount Vernon lot will be consumed by building or deck and will substantially block existing sight lines and eliminate a butter privacy. Noise and light from a deck that will sit eight feet or more above grade will reflect, reflect directly into abutting properties. Um, okay, and in terms, and then then from based on what I've heard here, um, the stairs from the deck essentially interrupt contiguous space. And as such, there is no 25 by 25 open space. Um, and another thing that I, 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 I got from the discussion earlier was that the building height has a maximum of 20 feet. And, um, and that's sort of based on the average grade of the property, but the average grade of the, you know, the average grade of the garage, um, that height will still be exceeded, even with what I'm guessing is, and, and I, I don't have the new plans, but um, we'll also exceed that 20 foot requirement. And that's, that's um, all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next on the list that identified is Edwin Schmidt. Hi, uh, this is Edwin Schmidt's wife, Gail Volcasian. I am the, uh, we're the rear butters. And I'm not gonna repeat everything that's in the materials we've already submitted or that I stated at the last meeting, but I would like to say, Thanks. Sorry, can I just confirm that uh, just the street address? I apologize. 70, 79 Situate Street. Thank the, you. Right behind um, the, the property. Um, I, I just would like to say uh, a couple of, uh, I, I, a general comment and a specific question for the board. What, um, my comment is that uh, it, I, I wanna just go on the record that we certainly have no objection to an ADU and to the applicant's mother getting living space on the property. It's the, the way that this is designed, it, it is just destroys our the back of our house and our ability, our sight lines, our light, air, views. Uh, you know, we have a small, very small yard like everyone else in the, in the neighborhood. And 
Um, we enjoy it a great deal. Uh, you know, we eat out there in, in good weather. We, you know, garden out there. We we entertain, um, and and basically this will just completely overrun my backyard. I have no privacy. It will be uh, right behind my fence, above my fence, substantially above my fence will be a, a huge deck that will essentially elevate the backyard um, well above fence height and a, a building that will be from our perspective down below 24 feet high, just blocking the rest of my backyard. Um, and so it's really just devastating to us, to our enjoyment of the, of the property. And, and moreover, I think it's gonna set a precedent that the spaces between houses, which are the only open space um, in this very tight neighborhood are just gonna be blocked now with new two-story buildings if this is the new rule. And I think that's really unfortunate for the, for the neighborhood. Um, flooding is a huge issue for us. I'm not content with a dry well because we already get a lot of water draining from that property into ours. And I think between the new building, the extended uh, driveway, and the fact that this deck will basically mean that nothing's gonna grow under it, all those factors are gonna to lead to substantially more flooding. And, and we already have a problem with flooding. So I really am very concerned about that issue. Um, so all in all, uh, you know, those are kind of my general comments that I would like um, the board to be aware of. But I do have one specific question, if I may uh, pose it, about the open usable space definition in the bylaw, which um, one of the requirements, in addition to the 25 feet um, minimum in both directions, is that it's deemed usable only if at least 75% of the area has a grade of less than 8%. And somehow that requirement does not seem consistent to me with adding up um, a piece of yard and a piece of deck that are, you know, eight feet apart uh, or whatever it is. Um, if you can't have a grade of more than 8%, how can, you, um, how can you add two completely separate um, areas that are that disparate in height? So that's a question that I have. And uh, those are my only comments for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, next on our list, is uh, Sean Snyder. Hey, Christian, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things that came up. Um, I know it's obvious, but I need your address for the record. Oh, sorry, 106 Mount Vernon Street. A uh, couple of things that came up in regard to, uh, Mary suggested that she called Jenna, our architect. There, we have no, no knowledge of that. So maybe she didn't leave a message and that's her prerogative. Um, our neighbors did not approach us. Uh, they chose to hire a lawyer to do that for them. Um, we are very approachable people. We have made it, I mean, I think we've talked last time about how welcoming we aim to be, and I don't think I've ever done anything to counter that. Um, we did go around and talk to all the neighbors. Uh, there was a moment last fall when we were in the process of doing this when we admittedly had a much larger and uglier build that Jenna was deterring us from doing, but we were trying to like, you know, maximize everything. And she talked sense into us, me specifically. Um, and we ended up with this really, what we thought was a great uh, project. Um, and when we were meeting, we met Ginger on the front porch. My mother-in-law met with Ginger on the front porch and showed her the plans in, back in the fall. So then this, uh, I forget the timeline exactly, but when we started this process, I think a few months ago, more earnestly, we walked around and talked to all the abutting neighbors that were available. I think Ms. Pokini was not home or didn't answer the door when my wife walked around. Uh, we talked to Gail and Ned. We talked to some neighbors we didn't know. Um, we talked to uh, Kareem and Galen, who are our other side abutting neighbors who would arguably be more impacted by this than anybody. And they are in support of it. Um, so to say that we haven't done the good neighbor thing and reached out, I think is, um, I just want to defend myself and my family for that because I don't think that's true at all. Um, I'd also like to point out that our abutting neighbors, uh, have a garage, have an addition and have a deck. And, uh, this is the abutting neighbors, uh, the towers who have been on the call. I remember when we first moved into this house or early when we moved into this house, uh, Ginger was talking about 
how she regretted not putting a second floor on her deck and, or her, sorry, not, not her deck, a second floor on her addition. And, you know, was kind of prompting us for like advice and like kind of suggesting things that we might want to consider when we inevitably do this, things that they knew we were going to do when we moved in. We've also known them for about 12 years because we used to live across the street. And I would like to think we were good neighbors then. And they were great neighbors to us too. You know, we had a really solid community. Um, so it's really just kind of sad to me that this has come to this point of people not talking to each other. Um, there also, this is a little bit for context, and I don't know if this applies in the same way it does for real estate comps, but on Situate Street across from Galen Ned, there is a whole string of houses with uh, multi-story decks that loom large over their neighbors in the back on Newport Street. Some of them are our, our friends that live over on Newport Street. We've seen the decks. It's not a problem. It's, you know, a cozy yard, and they also, you know, bought that that house knowing that the 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 deck was there and that you know the property sloped everything everything was kind of you know known at that point um and i also believe last session mary uh the, our neighbor's lawyer was saying that we did not uh count as a hardship because of the, top the topography of our yard so i'm wondering why the neighbors who may be geographically downhill from us are proposing this as it might be a hardship to them. I think there are a lot of things that have been established already throughout this neighborhood. We're really not trying to do anything crazy or new. We are trying to follow the bylaws as, as they are set. We're trying to you know, uh, identify uh, setbacks as best we can. Um, and I think we've done that and our, our architect Jenna is great with this. So I appreciate all of her support uh, in navigating this process. Um, and just as a final note, I'm, I mean, I, I know that this neighborhood is uh, notoriously wet. I mean, we we live next to Spring Street. So I think there's a reason that the, the street is called Spring Street. And I, I just um, am curious why all of a sudden we are being accused of flooding people's basements. And um, if there is uh, something outside of the, the, the dry well that needs to be navigated, I think, you know, yeah, we could talk about that, but I don't know why this is all so very accusatory. And I agree with um, anybody else who came up and talked and said that this would be great to work out as neighbors. Uh, and I wish we had had that olive branch extended earlier. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, so it is 835. So we have. 10 minutes remaining, we have Edwin uh, Schmidt for a second time. Okay. I will be very brief, um, but I just want to respond to um, what Sean said, um, <laughs> because I, I feel a need to defend myself. It's absolutely true that Bailey uh, came by in November and told us that they were going to be building an ADU. She also said, and I wrote it down at the time, that it was going to be 300 square feet it would be tucked in behind our garage and she didn't think we would notice it or be affected by it. And nothing was stated about the deck. And uh, that was in November. And the next thing I heard was uh, when this was posted um, on the town website. So uh, this is not something that I was aware of in terms of the massive scope of this particular project. And um, we, I'm not claiming uh, that it's a hardship to be downhill. It's a fact that um, if the property that's right behind us and uphill uh, paves over and builds on their property, that it's gonna flood into, into our lot. I'm not claiming that that's a hardship within the zoning statute. It's just a fact in terms of how the, the land is sloped. And yeah, there are some, there are some uh, houses that have a high deck. I, I agree with Sean on that. Um, but there is no property in the neighborhood that has a high deck um, and also a two-story large building that is, um, you know, takes up half of your backyard that the deck doesn't take up. And I, I would have no objection to a garage-sized um, building, which is kind of what I had thought this plan might be. Um, this is very, very different in terms of um, what's being constructed on the lot and how it impacts the neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then we have uh, Ginger Tower uh, for a second time. What do I do? Yeah, so, um, so um, 
I was just going to um, agree with um, Ned and um, Gail in terms of there was no sit down with us going over the details of the plans. We were told that they were going to that they were going to be doing some sort of an addition. No details regarding that were presented to us in any detail. Um, yes, um, Marty did try to talk to Ginger. We were um, we were on our way out at the time. And as such, um, you know, we're around all the time, all the time. And no one came by and sat down and said, this is, this exactly is what we are proposing. That did not happen. May I also say, my name is Ginger Tower, 110 Mount Vernon Street. Marty did show me or tried to show me plans, but it was not these plans. And at that time, the wind was whipping around. She couldn't find the page she wanted or pages she wanted to show me. She, I think she was a little anxious about showing me the plans, but it was it was not these plans. I never saw these plans. Okay. And and may I say, we all agree that Madi is a lovely person, an upstanding citizen devoted to her family and has many supporters. It is important to note that her supporters, except for one, are not a butters. Therefore, this permanent oversized garage with an apartment above the garage and an enormous deck will have no impact on their homes and the enjoyment of their yards. For instance, privacy, open air space, sunlight, and shadows. We we lead a very quiet life. Not that everybody, we expect to leave a quiet life like we do, but we are very quiet. And we've been very, very accepting of everyone in this neighborhood. And I think everyone in this neighborhood has been accepting of everyone else. This never been, to my knowledge, a problem before. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Both people who have their hands raised have just spoke a second ago, so I'll go ahead and lower their hands. Um, are there any further members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Once, going twice. Okay, the public comment period for this hearing will be closed. Um, I thank everyone who, uh, who spoke on, uh, on this topic. So with that, uh, the board now needs to go back and discuss this further. Um, so taking a very sort of dry look at this, um, if the board is of the position that this is a detached accessory unit, or an accessory building with an accessory dwelling unit that is six feet off the side yard line, six feet off the rear lot line at least, and no taller than 20 feet, and it doesn't increase the uh, overall lot coverage beyond 35%. Um, if it is a, a detached structure, then it is a buy right proposal. Um, because even though the lot is non-conforming, this is not adding any new, this is not changing the nature of any non-conformity and it is not it is not increasing the nature of any non-conformity, it's not creating any new non-conformity according to um, the interpretation of usable open space that uh, is provided by the zoning official. That said, you know, the questions are raised about the, you know, and that we had, we discussed this briefly last time as well, as to whether we're comfortable saying that usable open space can um, be at two completely different levels um, as it is in this case. So I think that's something that the board should um, should consider. We should, um, and then I think we do need to determine what our sense is on, um, on the proposed uh, accessory structure. And then if there 
is a determination that's, I mean, I think the, the determination that needs to be made by the board is that, that um, you know, this is not, and not an attached structure. The question then becomes if the board was to make that determination, can they attach conditions to such a determination? Um, which I'm, I'm uncertain how we would go about doing that, um, but would certainly like to hear from other board members how we might do that. Um, and then the other thing, the, as was recommended, um, is, you know, is, would, is there still an opportunity for um, the proponents, the applicants to uh, consider some of the comments that have been made over the past two sessions by uh, by their abutter, abutting neighbors um, to scale anything down or back in order to, to try to alleviate some of their concerns? Um, or are we at the point now where we're really just being asked to, to make a decision? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, in, in some ways, I think that we're less, the, the application before us is for a variance on the assumption that, that a number of provisions of the zoning bylaw are, <clears throat> are, uh, are violated and and you need a variance for them and and there's also at least technically a uh, uh, an application for a special permit regarding usable open space but I and I suppose that we probably need to deal with that in some way um, but actually in some respects we know that the application before us either hasn't been shown yet to be fully compliant. Like for example, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a calculation of, of what the total, uh, we, we do have a determination about the 25 square, 25 feet, but we don't have uh, something that tells us what, whether it's over 30% or not. Um, we know that on lot coverage, they're a little over and they have to do something to cut back that big, back a little bit. Um, and I wonder whether a way of addressing this is not is basically to say, hey, well, to make the decision on whether this is attached or not attached, uh, my preferred way of saying it. Um, and then and the, and and then only make that determination. Uh, for the rest, once once, Mr. Chomp and his fellows uh, have that they can do what we just did in the beginning of this to go through the other the other things. They may have more time to do it and more information in front of them. And if they have the guidance that they should view this as a not attached structure, um, maybe that's that's enough. Issues like whether the the issue that I believe Mrs. Tower raised about the uh, uh, about what average grade of what uh, is something that they could do, and all of those things are difficult things for us to do, ultimately in support of a conclusion that we don't have any jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, if we don't have jurisdiction, I was thinking maybe being parsimonious about this and only making the decision that we have to make. Uh, and letting inspectional services deal with the other things might be the best best way uh, uh, to deal with this. Um, because otherwise, I, I feel uncomfortable dismissing this for lack of jurisdiction, as long as I know the plans before us are admitted not to be exactly compliant. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we've never seen the plan, and we will never have seen the plans that are the ones they really in, intend to go with. So that that's one point is is to try to say less rather than more and give more and leave more open to Mr. Uh, to inspectional services uh, to to work out the implications for that. They may that may turn out that there's a finding there that we need to look at and it may have to come back to us in some way and we can 
a deal with with waiving fees or whatever is necessary in order to make that not unnecessarily burdened. But I I feel that Mr. Champa focusing on it and knowing he's starting with the the premise that we've given him um, is, is apt to do a better job uh, than than we will do based on on just the hearing tonight. Um, and secondly, I I do think that that if we if we did hold this to ourselves and maybe maybe it would be desirable i don't think that there's any point at this point to have more of a hearing but there might be a reason to close the hearing and defer and and defer judgment until we have a chance to look at this more but i am attracted to the notion it, it, there's one of the things that's really sad about this case is a neighborhood that everybody has praised for its community and the way in which people get along and are mutually supportive of each other have given rise to the not so much bitter but but disappointed on all sides uh, feelings about one another and everyone feels themselves hurt um so connor is is quite right that that uh, if something isn't done to breach all of this and come up to some sort of a compromise that people are at the very least likely on both sides to be looking for an expensive time in court. And uh, and it it just seems to me that that uh, that standing on your rights is is not going to is not going to be good for the community and it may not be good ultimately for the individuals uh involved so no matter what we do i hope they start talking and talk in a way that that continues to be amicable and and respectful of the community that they have enjoyed and they'd like to continue to enjoy um, but with the notion that there may be a possibility of some give and take here that that can make can make life better for everyone well thank you mr Hanley. mr chairman Mr. DuPont. So if I can oversimplify Mr. Ham Hamlin's uh, comment, I mean, it, it sounds like the thinking is that potentially if we were to say that we don't think that this is attached, um, then we might have the opportunity to allow inspectional services to take a further look at it. Is Is that what I think Mr. Hanlon was saying, if I can ask him. Well, yeah, if, if we say that it's not attached, yes, I think that's right. I mean, it's it, that would that would take away the, the major reason why it is before us. Yeah. But if Mr. Champa says, but well, whether it's attached or not, it still violates this provision or that provision, then we're back where we started. And right. presumably he can could do that there ought to be some way of smoothing out the inconveniences of doing that. But at this point, uh, th that's really the best we can do. Because if we say it's not attached, the applicant will go back to ISD and ISD will either issue the permit or they won't. And if they come up with something new, then they come up with something new. Yeah, because when I was trying to put this into context, it almost felt to me as if it was an appeal of a denial by or a decision by the building inspector. It, it kind of felt like that. Yeah. And and I, I think in fairness to the abutters, I do have, if I may, Mr. Uh, Chairman, a question for Attorney O'Connor, um, because she's made reference to the section of the bylaw uh, 5.313. And I presume that you're referring to B, um, where it says an accessory building attached to the principal building yes. shall be considered. Yes, Ms. Attorney Dupont. So that's the distinction, then, right? It's it's sort of the it's sort of the viewpoint from your perspective that it is attached, and then the question from our point of view as to whether it's attached. So, not to oversimplify again, but I just wanted to clarify that that's where you are coming from. Correct. Okay, thanks a lot. If I may suggest that perhaps putting this over for a couple of weeks to give the applicant and the abutters an opportunity to meet, um, to try to work out, um, perhaps come to some terms, would probably be more productive. I don't know if the applicant's amenable to that. 
I, I did leave a message for um, Ms. Ellison when I called. Um, so uh, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Other thoughts from the board? Um, so to, to Mr. Hanlon's point, I think it's a, and, and Mr. Dupont as well, I think, you know, it, it's worthwhile for the board to solidifying its uh, determination in regards to whether it's attached or detached in its opinion. Um, and then that will sort of allow the conversation to move forward and remove this question that is sort of lingering over everything else. Um, and then beyond that, if that sort of allows uh, the conversation to move forward, knowing exactly what the what the uh, sort of the, the guidelines in the what part of the zoning bylaw does apply to what we're discussing um, and how that's to be interpreted. And then um, the we can ask the applicants to, you know, at that point, um, the boards, as Mr. Hanlon pointed out, the board still doesn't have final documentation from the applicants. So, the, you know, we would continue, the applicants can either um, amend their plans to become compliant and then request to with, withdraw their special permit request, or um, uh, if they have a further need to, uh, for a special permit, then they can come back uh, before the board again. Um, but as has been um, expressed, it would be a good opportunity for the uh, for the applicants and their um, and their architect to sort of consider uh, some of the comments they've heard over the last couple of sessions um, and to possibly sit down with uh, uh, with some of their neighbors to better clarify sort of what some of the issues are and how those might be addressed and in, in, in an amicable way. Um, but for the purposes, I think, of uh, of this evening, to Mr. Hanlon's point, I think it's probably best that we uh, limit the scope of our determinations to uh, the, the question of attached versus detached, and then um, refer it back to inspectional services and back to the applicant to determine how they want to proceed. Um, are there any further questions from the board in that regard? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dubon. So I do have a question about the sequence of doing it that way, and perhaps it is the better way to do it. But I mean, if we were to say detached or attached, I mean, that's one of the arguments that the abutters are making. And I wonder if that undercuts uh, the opportunity for the for the, you know, the parties to get together and talk. Um, maybe we should do it that way and, you know, make a call for inspectional services and say, this is what we think. But I, I didn't want to um, undercut the possibility of having fruitful uh, discussions uh, among the abutters and the applicant. So I'm not sure what other members of the board think about that, but. Um, uh, I'm just thinking that maybe we could stay that determination on our part as far as communicating with inspectional services. You know, perhaps that's not the better way, but I do have a concern that if we say it's one thing or the other, then that may undercut the conversations that might be uh, beneficial. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So I, I certainly take Mr. DuPont's point um, I wonder, though, I mean, it seems to me that that if I were sort of representing one side or another, I'd be looking now and saying that the board is generally inclined towards the view of, of saying that uh, uh, that this is not attached. And, uh, and the real risk is that that will be overthrown at some point, because obviously it's a close question. There's you people can take a view of it in different ways. And that provides the kind the uncertainty that gets resolved by saying, let's come to an agreement without, um, let's come to an agreement without, uh, without having to force the question. Um, 
and uh, my preference would be to be clear on where we stand on this. I, I think that under the circumstances, uh, it does it is it is fairly clear, and and Ms. O'Connor can explain to her clients what the risks are. Uh, but I, at this point, I think I'm not sure that offering sort of a glimmer of a hope that we would suddenly change position from where we are tonight is necessarily productive of a useful conversation among the the interested parties. I think it's really the risk that not only the risk that maybe that we wouldn't be upheld on appeal. Uh, but also the the risk of having of having to go through all of the cost and inconvenience and anguish that that litigation would would uh, do. I I would I would certainly be willing to give up a lot of being right in order to avoid that hassle, uh, and hope that that and I'm I'm sure that that Ms. O'Connor would who's lots of experience with this. You know, we lawyers may love the conflict, but the clients generally don't. Um, so I, I could go either way on this, but I think that that it it's helpful in moving things forward to give a clearer direction to to ISD as because that that gives you an ability to begin going forward and and make this a little bit more concrete. But I think. In some ways, you'll end up pretty much the same place either way. I think I do know that the applicant has his hand hand raised, um, and um, I will go ahead and uh, and, and recognize Mr. Snyder and um, as to the purpose he's raising his hand. Thank you. Um, I guess a couple things to think about. I mean, I, I genuinely appreciate the perspective that you all are taking as far as um, maintaining neighborly community and support there. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I think that is a, a value that we hold very dearly um, with all of our actions and, and deeds. Um, I think we can probably figure something out. Uh, that said, I think we could probably shave some space off the deck. I don't know how much um, room for navigating we have on the unit itself, because I think there's a certain um, level of space that my mother-in-law deserves. Um, and as we heard last time we met, 500 square feet kept on being referred to as a small ADU. Uh, I don't think we're doing anything that's too overreaching in what we're requesting. Um, again, if these requests came to us prior to uh, the first zoning meeting, I think we would have been more amenable to talking about them directly. But once you get a letter from a lawyer before somebody talks to you, you get a little, you know, defensive maybe. Um, so things to consider. I'm happy to talk to our neighbors. Uh, like I said, I think we can shave a little bit off the deck. I don't know if that will necessarily achieve what they are looking for, um, but we're happy to talk about it and, and navigate through the process and, um, I don't know, hopefully maintain relationships. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just, just in sort of in thinking what the overall risk is, I'd like to just remind everyone of what the chair said at the last hearing, that if in fact we're wrong about this being attached, and if in fact it should be viewed as if it, excuse me, wrong about it being not attached and we should view it as an attached structure, then it is clear that a variance will be necessary. And it is highly unlikely that the board would be able to grant it because as the chair pointed out last time, uh, there's nothing unique about this, about the shape of this property uh, that would fit within, fit it within the first of the criteria of, of the zoning bylaws. So, you know, we are not gonna have the final word on that necessarily. And uh, that is something that when people begin to tote up risks on either side, it's, it's you know, if, if everybody relies on their rights and we are right that it is attached, then Mr. Snyder may be headed for a big win. And if we are wrong, he's probably headed for a big loss. 
and the same thing is sort of the complement on the other side. So there's plenty of reason for people to, to whether there's lawyers in it involved or not, you're likely to come up with something that individually is better for each, for you and for your neighbors. And it's, and you're likely to avoid a, a tremendous risk and expense by maybe looking at it the way you would have looked at it before, even though there's water or water that's that's gone over the dam since then. Uh, it's it's just I, I hate to see the situation come up with with winners and losers. And unfortunately, I think that the bylaw is set up that if we had to just rely on the in the special services and ultimately a court has to rely on winners and losers, then it, it really is a winner take all situation that is not going to make this neighborhood of live up to the standards that it set for itself so far. Okay, so for this evening, um, so the board could, so we have before us a variance and a special permit application and we're sort of taking the stand that we're um, either appealing the decision of the building inspector or sort of clarifying our interpretation of something that the building inspector has determined is um, not clear in the zoning bylaw. And so we're essentially issuing what will be considered sort of a guiding opinion um, to be used to, uh, to further the discussion on this project. So um, I think then I have, I, I have a brief statement that I wrote, um, which I think we could take as a motion for the board board um, and should the board approve it then I think we would request of the applicant a continuance um, to a date certain uh, which will allow them an opportunity to uh, uh, to speak with their um, with their architect for their for them and the architect to speak with the building inspector but also um, as has been expressed several times to allow that applicant some time to to possibly confer with the neighbors and to see if there are some places where this um uh where the the needs of everyone sort of align and we can uh possibly come forward with a with a proposal that um uh, everyone can feel a lot more comfortable with um so with that um uh the statement i wrote is is upon review of the definitions for detached building and attached building the board determines that in this circumstance, the two buildings connected by an open deck are to be considered detached. And um, I think we could then, you know, further request that the applicant Uh, review the plans. Uh, in light of this determination. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, in a second, I'll be happy to move that, but I would strongly prefer to have the words not attached used rather than detached. Okay. Because not attached is not defined in the bylaw and detached is and you need to maintain the distinction. Oh, okay. With that amendment, I, I move that we adopt the chairman's statement. Second. Thank you both. Um, so what the board has in front of us, um, we have a vote to um, vote on the determination of the definition, for lack of a better term, um, which will be issued by vote of the board. Uh, the motion was made by Mr. Hanlon, seconded by Mr. DuPont. Um, and so the 
The statement reads, upon review of the definitions for detached building and attached building, the board determines that in this circumstance, the two buildings connected by an open deck are to be considered not attached. Further um, request that the applicant review the plans in light of this determination. Um, so that is a vote before the board. Um, so a vote of, of yes is a vote in favor of that. Um, of that statement and a vote of no would be in opposition to that statement. So then roll call vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Aye, whoops. Thank you. Um, Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Um, and the, uh, uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Thank you. And uh, Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. The chair votes aye. So that um, board's in favor of that statement. Um, and with that, I would, um, with the applicant's permission, request that we um, continue this hearing. Um, and we could continue. Continue to the there are several hearings on the schedule for the 25th. We could continue to the 25th. Um, the next meeting would be May 9th. So does either of those dates um, be more in favor? That's a question for Mr. Snyder and Ms. Ellis and this they how um, long they would like a continuance for. Do yeah. we have the option to withdraw our application? You do have the option to request a request to withdraw as well. I just don't know uh, if you want to leave your options open at this point or if you want to go ahead and withdraw at this stage and refile. So I think um, after talking to my client and you know understanding that they're living next to these neighbors for the next Yep. however many years mm -hmm. um you know we all like to get on the same page and um i think i can speak for this um family and say that we'd like to withdraw it and um redesign knowing um if we do have this ad deck um it would not be an attached structure um mm -hmm. so we can meet the um requirements for that and then have a open discussion with the neighbors to make sure everyone's comfortable with it before going back, back to the building. Okay. Uh, Mr. Snyder, are you in agreement with that? Yeah. Yes. That's a yes. Okay. So that is a request from the applicant to withdraw um, the application for a special permit uh, for 106 Mount Vernon Street. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? I understand that to be a withdrawing the application for variance as well. Uh, yes, thank you. And so I guess I just want to clarify a few points um, yeah. that um, we could potentially reduce the size of the deck um, or detach the structures altogether with no deck, um, like totally detached. <laughs> um, and both of those would be considered by right and not attached. And, and then the structure of the um, garage and ADU, mm -hmm. as long as it meets the accessory dimensions, which we've defined with the height and the setbacks, that that would also be considered by right with or without the deck is sort of, I just wanna that be clear. Should, yeah, I mean, that, that should be correct if it's substantially, you know, obviously would not be the same conditions as is shown today, but sort of that condition yeah. where the two structures are completely independent. Yeah. And they are just connected by an unenclosed structure. Um, I, th I think that what we're deter what our determination is, is that that should be considered to be not attached. Okay, great. Okay, so, uh, I move that the board accept the withdrawal of the special permit and variance requests for 106 Mount Vernon Street uh, to be issued 
without prejudice. Second. Is that Mr. Hanlon or Mr. DuPont, sorry. That was Pat. That was Pat. Okay, so a roll call vote of the board on the motion to withdraw. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the applications for 106 Mount Vernon Street are withdrawn. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation you. tonight. I appreciate everyone's participation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. And thank you for your patience too. All right, so this brings us to the next item on our agenda, which is item number five, docket 3738, 39 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, so if I could ask the applicant to go ahead and introduce themselves um, and tell us what they would like to do. And uh, I believe that uh, Diane Miller is their um, architect. So Colleen, if you wouldn't mind um, giving her co-hosting privileges. Please Thank proceed. You. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, we are here tonight to apply for one special permit for uh, usable open space. Um, so in this situation, we do not have um, the minimum lot area with uh, 25 foot dimensions in both directions in order for it to be eligible for the calculation. Um, that is consistent with most of the homes on Sunnyside. Um, which is its own separate uh, district within the R2 zoning district. Um, what we would like to do is we are requesting permission to build a rear addition that's 384 square feet total. Um, so that is 102 square feet on the first floor and 282 square feet on the second floor. Um, this addition would increase the gross floor area of our property of, of the home from 1,239 to 1,623 square feet. So it is still a pretty modestly sized home um, as are many of the homes on Sunnyside. Uh, the goal is to expand the small playroom that they have on the first floor on the back of the house right now, make it a little bit bigger, add a half bathroom on that first floor. And um, really most importantly, the thing that's driving this project is that they need to have a third bedroom. They have two small children um, and they have two bedrooms. So they would like to have that third bedroom so that their children can each have their own room. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the purpose of this project. The lot coverage does increase from 24% to 28.2, which is still below the 35% allowed. So fairly significantly below that. Um, and also worth noting, the proposed addition is over an existing basement level driveway, which would remain as such. Um, the addition will be supported on posts and there will still be driveway and parking beneath it. Um, so it only changes the landscape open space by five square feet. And that's just due to the reconstruction of the squares that it takes up a little bit more space, but essentially it's the same landscape open space situation that we have currently. Um, furthermore, the intention is to replace that asphalt driveway with pervious pavers. So we will actually be improving the um, permeable surfaces. And this is something that was discussed and already approved by conservation uh, back in February, February 16th. We did submit to the board a petition that was signed by the neighbors, including their immediate abutters who were in support of this project. Um, it's also worth noting several of the other neighbors have very similar rear additions. Uh, all of these duplex homes on Sunnyside are very similar and many of them have done similar rear additions. Um, it has no impact whatsoever on the front of the home. And we feel that it is consistent with the scale and the massing and the character of the neighborhood and therefore not substantially detrimental. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the, uh, in the uh, project review by the Conservation Commission, did they have any other comments that would be relevant? 
Not that I'm aware of. I noticed okay. that Brendan is on now instead of Caitlin. Brendan, was there anything else that you can think of from conservation that had a relevance to this? Uh, no, not that I can think of, Diane. And thank you for covering that really nicely. Um, the, just the just the driveway having the required pavers was the biggest um, ask from them, um, and they felt comfortable with the project. So um, we were able to get that approved, which is great. Um, I did note that the um, so in this neighborhood there are essentially houses with zero lot line on one side that are, um, so they're duplex houses, but they're not on single property. They're on, I believe on split property. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so the abutter actually has a window on the property line facing uh, what will be the new addition. Um, and so, and but you're, I believe you're going to a, a foot and a half away from that window. Um, on your side, are there any require are there any specific requirements um, from fire code that you're aware of that you need to be um, considered in that case? I don't believe there are because it's uh, two family. But if there was something that Mike Champa required of us, then we would certainly be willing to accommodate that. But okay. I believe it's essentially treated from a code perspective as a two family home. Okay. Um, and that the window on the abutting structure isn't required for egress for any reason. It's, it, it looks like it's, I think it's in a sunroom or something like that. Okay. Other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, last fall, we had uh, a case Ultimately, Mr. Fleming's case uh, was what prompted it, but there had been a decision administratively by ISD that, in general, the kind of case where you have zero open space to begin with and zero open space afterwards, and you're not actually changing anything other than the gross floor area, um, was something that could be done because there was no the, the, the ISD would find no substantial impact in those cases, so we wouldn't have to decide whether or not uh, they were more detrimental. And I was wondering if there's any explanation for why it is that uh, this case is was sent to us. What is it that makes this different from the cases that were covered by the decision last fall? I mean, certainly, I have no notice from the from the inspectional services that there is concern that there may be a significant impact from this. Right, but you know, as we all know, that excuse me, as we all know, that basically the way this is supposed to work is that they will start with making a quite making a determination of whether I mean whether there's a it's a significant extension, and then we get to decide whether or not. Uh, that is a, has a sub, substantial additional impact. And that first, it's desirable in these cases not to have them come to us if they don't have to. And again, we, we previously, I thought, we we're at a point where those kinds of zeros to a greater amount of zero wouldn't come to us, which would save us a lot of time and saves applicants a lot of time. And I guess I don't really understand what it is that makes this different from that that we should be looking at. If there's nothing, I, I you know, I, I guess that all we can have is a is a further conversation to see just what the guiding principle, what the guiding principle is is here. But I thought we weren't going to be seeing these cases anymore. I guess I ask the the applicant and their architect are. Did inspectional services give a specific explanation as to why a special permit was required? Uh, no, I have done in the past, my office has done other projects like this where it's a zero to a zero and yep. they've always come through this process. So oh, I was okay. not aware personally that there was a change um, in that policy. But I mean, we're okay with if it's something that you're saying is now a by right 
um, you know, that the special permit's not needed. I'm I'm fine with that as well. Well, they do make, need to make the finding. Right. And in the absence, I guess in the absence of their having made a finding, then we make the finding. Um, I guess we could do that. Um, and then, um, yeah, because essentially this comes out of a decision by this, I believe it was Supreme Judicial Court, the Belalta v. Brookline decision from a year or two ago, uh, which clarified the, the parameters of a Section 6 determination um, under state code in regards to pre-existing non-conforming uh, building and structures that if that the allows the build, the zoning official to make an initial determination that um, if there's an existing nonconformity and it is being um, extended, altered, or um, reconstructed, then there's uh, the if they make a determination that it is not um, significant, then it can be approved by right, and then if Otherwise, it has to go before the zoning board for determination that it is not significantly more detrimental. Um, and so we've, on the cases that have come before us, we've always sort of taken the approach that the, by the department forwarding it to us, that they have made the determination that it is not insignificant and therefore the board needs to make a determination. Um, because, but the only determination that under the bylaw that the board is allowed to make is under 813B is um, yeah, no alternate, no alteration construction, uh, excuse me, no alteration reconstruction extension or structural change to a single or two family residential structure that increases the non-conforming nature of said structure shall be permitted unless there's a finding by the Board of Appeals that the proposed alteration reconstruction extension or structural change will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. So I think that is what the um, would be the question before us. Um, this evening. Uh, are there any further questions from the board? If not, I will go ahead and open for public comment on this hearing. Um, as stated before, uh, the purpose of public comment is to provide um, information and commentary to the board as it relates to the matter at hand. If you would like to speak, you may raise your hand using the raise hand button on the participants tab. If you're dialing in on the phone, you may dial star nine. Are there any members of the public who wish to address this application? Seeing none. Oh, Mr. <laughs> Moore, you got yourself in just in time. Well, I apologize, Mr. Chair. I've been <laughs> looking at documents to figure this out exactly about my question. Um, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I, I think, based on what I saw online, there's a very large tree in front of this house. Is that correct? Mr. Chair? Um, I would refer that question to the applicant. Is there a large tree in front of the house? Yeah, there's a very large yes. tree. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the reason I'm speaking at all is that uh, to do the work that you're talking about, I, I don't know about accessing the back of the property to uh, do the work, but uh, this is a very significant tree, at least mm -hmm. it's looked like. There are also some large street trees, and um, I would I assume that tree is going to remain because the worst thing behind the house. And if that is true, you're going to have to do some pretty significant protection of the critical root zone. Um, I'm just giving you a heads up and you'll need to talk to the tree warden about probably how to do that best or, or look on the, uh, the website. Uh, I don't believe this tree is in necessarily a setback. Mm -hmm. uh, you will have to protect it to not during the process of the construction, perhaps. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I would note that these houses have actually a, a, essentially both functions as a back alleyway um, oh. um, behind the house. So I believe the construction activities can take place from the rear without impacting the front of the structure. Oh, that, that that's excellent news, Mr. Chair. I, I was trying to figure this out. That's why you got that. Mm. Is, I almost missed making the comment. So, okay, then probably it obviates my concern. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Um, with that, seeing no other public comment on this, I'll go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, with that, then returning back to the board. So what we have before us um, 
is, is what amounts to a section six determination, um, which the board typically does by reviewing the special permit requirements um, as put forward in section 3.3 three, um, and under section 813B. Um, so the question is the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit within the district. This is an allowed use um, and the special permit is not required. Um, the requested use is essential or desirable to public convenience and welfare. This is an extension of a house to allow it to remain livable for the occupants of the house. Um, it doesn't detract from um, the neighborhood in general. Uh, requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Um, again, it has no impact on either of those. It does not change the, the ownership structure of the building. Uh, requested use will not overload any public system. Um, this does not change uh, significantly any of the utilities that are required for this property. Requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. This is a, a standard addition uh, that you see on several of these houses and is is fully to the rear of the house. It is not uh, primarily within the public view. Um, as was noted, they did go before the Conservation Commission, um, as this is within the 200-foot riverfront zone, um, and they have received a, approval from that board uh, for the uh, for the project they have proposed. Uh, requested use is not detrimental to the public health or welfare. Um, requested use will not cause excess of use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and, and then the final thing that the board would need to find is that the increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, so those are the findings that, that the board needs to, to make. I believe that the, this application certainly meets those requirements. and. Uh, would ask the board if there are any um, conditions that the board would uh, wish to impose. I would note that uh, the board does have three standard conditions that it imposes when it um, issues a determination. Uh, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, number two, the building inspector is hereby notified that they are to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures that at any time they, de they determine that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And number three, the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Are there any additional conditions the board deems necessary? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin. So moved. Uh, so that is a motion to uh, approve the, uh, or I guess we wouldn't say it's a motion to approve this special permit, but it's a, uh, a motion to uh, determine that the proposed addition does not constitute, what's the official language there? I mean, this is not treating, substantially more detrimental. Yes, I, I mean, I, ultimately we'll, I mean, if we have conditions, we have to have a special permit for the conditions to go on. So this, this, I mean, notwithstanding my personal view that we didn't need to hear this at all, but it was pleasant talking to everyone. Um, that we ought to uh, we ought to just grant the special permit with the conditions that we have and and hope we can we can maybe spread the word more that that this has to be taken up with ISD because you can get out of talking with us if you want to on a lot of these cases and that's probably that's not probably good for us but it's, except in a way but it's good for you. I mean the other thing the board could do is the board could we could strike the three conditions and just make the section six determination well we could always do we could do that in all of those cases right in some ways mm -hmm. but 
No, I would be just reluctant to okay. invent a new thing at this point. This is like many other cases we had. We'll, I'm going to write the opinion, and I'd like yep. to be able to use the old forms. Perfect. Okay, so then this is a motion to approve the special permit request uh, for 39 Sunnyside Avenue with the standard three conditions. As put forward by Mr. Hanlon, do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So a vote of the board. Um, excuse me. Um, of the voting members of the board, uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so that is approved. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, this thank you, everyone. Up, you're quite welcome. Uh, this brings us to item six on our agenda, docket 37390 Brantwood Road. Um, <clears throat> if I could ask the applicant and their um, architect to introduce themselves. And uh, I see Mr. Mayor is already a co-host, so you folks are good to go. Hi, I'm Rainey, um, and my husband, John, he's unfortunately, it's like the one night he was not able to be here. Um, but we've been in Arlington for over 10 years. Um, my daughter just graduated last year from high school, um, and our son is in ninth grade. Um, we love our neighborhood. We love the house. Um, we know the former owner um, was here for over 50 years, and we promised him we would never, you know, touch the dark room, like we'd leave the original wood, and, you know, we just really love the house. So um, that said, it is over 100 years old, and our family's growing, so um, just as they get older, that not, no more children that we know of, but, um, you know, like having a half bath downstairs is something we'd love to solve for, um, and I'm an artist, we'd love to have an artist studio, um, so that's what... <laughs> We went to Alan. He specializes in um, working with older homes and keeping the integrity of the original plan. So without further ado, he can do a better job of describing it. Thank you, Randy. And, and uh, thank you to the board. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and walk you through the project and um, what we're asking for. So um, 90 Brantwood is right over here near Spy Pond. And the tricky thing about it when you look in is <clears throat> that you're, we're right on the curve of a street and our house is, um, you know, the location of the house and the relationship to the street <clears throat> is unlike any other in terms of uh, you know, having the curve and the distance in this care case uh, shrinking, it's a pre-existing uh, non-conforming structure that's, uh, that is within the front yard setback. And our plan will be extending that non-conformity a small amount um, and the addition itself. And for that, we're asking for a, uh, a variance and then um, the, additional square feet is just over 750 square feet and had we not been asking for a variance we would have massaged the building to get it under so we could have avoided a special permit but in uh since we're here anyway we thought we would ask for the special permit so that we didn't have to massage uh, but that is uh possible uh this is the existing house and over here is an existing porch, covered porch. That's 14.4 feet. The house itself is 16.3 feet away from the property line. And as I said, this is the porch we would be taking out and extending slightly. We we're also pushing it back a little bit. And uh, this is the proposed, and it would go from 14.4 to 13.7 because we're coming out a little bit further in that regard. Um, I'll just walk you through uh, first the what the house looks like and I'll say we just met a week ago with the historic commission because we are within a historic district and uh, had uh, full approval and support from them with I think there was uh, one set of windows they asked us to we had six over ones and they asked us to change them to six over sixes but other than that uh, the plans were approved and in keeping with it uh, with the architecture and the uh, district. 
This is the side view of the house front. And then this is the porch, which we'd be taking out. And you can sort of see its relationship or lack of relationship to the abutter. Um, and that's the porch. And then wrapping around the back side of the house. Um, uh, these are, this is the existing basement plan showing where the deck, the uh, porch currently is with the proposed addition shown. And then this is sort of going from existing to proposed. And then existing first floor with demo shown and proposed. And this is, this is just uh, a brick patio that's three steps up. It's not actually a porch or deck, but it's just a patio. Um, and this part is exterior. So that's part of the, that would be covered. And these are actually the salvage. We're salvaging the columns because they're so beautiful and we're using them. Uh, second floor, again, showing the existing, uh, the roof of the existing covered porch and the proposed outline. And the other thing we're doing is over here, and this is how we got over 750, is that the second floor in the back was pulled back. And in the proposal, it would just be flush with the existing foundation. Um, and at least the way I was reading, um, the requirement for a special permit is that if it's 750 square feet or more, and not all of it is within the foundation, that we needed a special permit. There's actually less than 750 square feet in the this addition, but when you add this area, you hit 750. This is the existing roof, proposed roof, existing front elevation, proposed elevation, side elevation, proposed elevation, rear and proposed rear. And then the last side and the proposed last side. And, you know, we looked at this and in our opinion, well, it's your, yours to determine whether this is in any way more detrimental mm -hmm. to the neighborhood than what's existing. Great, thank and you. That, I, happy to answer any questions. Okay. Um, so did you sit down with inspectional services and review this project? No, we have not. We spoke to the administrator of yeah. for your for the, for the zoning board and they okay. said this is what we needed to do. Got it. All right. So I think we similar to the prior case, I think we could have saved you a lot of headache. Um and so we're, the, we're happy if you tell us that this is fine <laughs> um and all i have to do is shave four square feet off i'll shave four square feet off and and go straight to inspectional services but uh so the special permit for so the definition for a large addition um i think i have to find that The large additions, so no alteration or addition, which increases the gross floor area of a building by the lesser of 750 square feet or 50% or more of the building gross floor area. Uh, unless the addition, <clears throat> excuse me, the addition is constructed entirely within the existing foundation or the Board of Appeals finds that the alteration is in harmony with other structures or vicinities. And then um, the Bylaw was amended last year to include the phrase at the end, the, the increase in gross floor area used to determine the applicability of this section shall only include additions outside the existing footprint of the building. Okay. So and we spoke to the administrator. Okay. Yep. We we spoke to the administrator and they said we need to do that, but our the the addition itself is only 697 square feet of yep. because i know the porch doesn't count 
the existing okay. portion doesn't count. So, so we will not request a special permit. Yeah, so I don't think you need one. Lovely. Um, and then if you could go to the site plan. This is the proposed. Yep. Perfect. So now I'll ask Mr. Hanlon to, to steer me back if I go astray. Um, so this house currently ha is compliant with the left side side yard setback. And in the final, it will be compliant still. Um, it's compliant with the rear yard and will remain so. The there is an existing non-conformity with the front yard setback, and that is going to be increased from, I think you had said 14.4 14. 14. 14. to 13.7. 14.4 to 13.7. So under the Balalta v. Brookline decision, um, an existing non-conformity can be for for single for, for single and two family houses, an existing nonconformity can be increased by a determinate by a section six determination under section six of chapter 40A that the change is not more detrimental than the existing condition, um, which would not require a variance. And so I would just ask Mr. Hanlon if he concurs with that approach. Yes, I do. Um, so then it sort of changes the the tenor of things because the obviously as you as you're well aware the variance requirements are stricter are rather strict and stringent um, and established under state law. Whereas here, um, as state law grants for pre-existing non-conforming structures that are single and two family that if there is an existing non-conformity there can be an alteration in that non-conformity that does not require a variance so long as the determination can be made that it is not substantially more detrimental that's, um, we, that's what we are hoping for from you so that's what so i think that's the approach the board will take um with that, I would turn back to the board and ask if there are any questions um, in regards to uh, this application. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Um, so I, I'm glad you brought that up because it looked to me like we were talking about a variance for eight and a half inches, which I think <laughs> as de minimis as that was gonna be, it was gonna be a stretch under the uh, statute. But does this put us back where we were with the first case tonight, which is this gets sent back because it's quite possible that had the applicant gone to see inspectional services first, they would have said that they didn't need to be here, uh, especially for that, that difference of eight and a half inches on the corner in the front um, going from 14.4 to 13.7. Do I understand? that correctly, Mr. Chairman, because I think that would be my preference, would be just to send it back and not have to make a determination under Bell Alta. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly it would be the option of the zoning, of the zoning official to make that determination, um, but they would not necessarily have to make, you know, they, they could still say that it is not in the it is not insubstantial and they do anyways. Um, in this case where we're changing from an open porch to an enclosed two-story addition, um, it is a fairly substantial change in the in the use of that portion of the property. And so in that case, um, I, I, I can only speculate, but I would believe that the zoning official would have possibly referred it to the board to make this determination. Okay, so we're operating on the hot potato. Um, Very similar to the previous case. Okay. The board is so, taking 
as chair, I'm taking the, the opinion that the zoning official has referred it to us to make this determination. Works for me. Any further questions for the board? <clears throat> Seeing none, I will go ahead and um, again, we'll open this hearing for public comment. Public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing the decision. Uh, members of public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling by phone may dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. Um, and once all questions and comments have been addressed, uh, the public comment period will be closed. So with that, the first hand up is Mr. Steve Moore. Uh, Mr. Chairman, why don't you let Mr. Benson go first, then I'll speak if you don't mind. We can certainly do that. Oh, Mr. Benson. Thank you. My name is Eugene Benson, 16 Hillsdale Road, the backyard of my house abuts the backyard of the applicant's house, 90 Brantwood. I can see their house from my backyard and from the windows at the back of my house and from the porch on the side of my house. We have no objections at all to the proposal. We think it's a nice addition to the house and in keeping with the neighborhood in scale and massing, we don't think it's detrimental. We think it's nice for the neighborhood. We've lived here for over almost 33 years and many houses in the neighborhood have had extensive renovations and additions added over time. And that's how neighborhoods change. That's how neighborhoods stay current. Um, we're in favor of this project and would hope that it's approved by the board. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Oh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I, uh, I wanted Mr. Benson to go first because my, my point is non sequitur and not wanting to break my record of having something to say on everything. I figured I would say one thing here. Could I ask the applicant right through you, Mr. Chair, uh, whether or not this is the home that had the Dutch elm tree in front of it that was removed in the past two years? Um, we didn't have any trees removed. Oh, no, no, no. I, oh. I, yeah, no, I was wondering, it died. Uh, if it was not this house, it was must have been the one maybe next door. And I, I apologize for-, for I think It was two doors down, the big, yeah. the large one. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a historic aside, the, a tree that in this neighborhood, and I'm not at all surprised that the house is 100 years old because, you know, Dutch elm trees are rare. It was one of the very last Dutch elms, mature Dutch elms in this area that unfortunately died about two years ago. It showed mm -hmm. the, the age of the neighborhood and just a little bit of history. One of the very last ones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. That was Mayor. a sad day. I remember we were all, <laughs> it was a hallmark Absolutely. of the tree, you know, right on the corner. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Foskett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? I certainly can, sir. Um, so I, uh, my name is Charles Foskett. I live in 101 Brantwood Road, uh, sort of almost directly across the street. I've lived here for 49 years, uh, very close to uh, the prior resident and also to uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Sloan and Mr. Swansinger, and uh, I have uh, no objections to this um, proposal. I think also I'd just like to tell the board that they have been extremely forthcoming in providing the details of their plans and their thoughts well in advance of uh, moving forward. And uh, I uh, hope that the board moves forward and supports uh, this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any further public comments or questions on this application? Seeing none, the chair will go ahead and close public comment on this hearing. Um, so what we have before us um, was initially an application for a variance and a special permit. I think we have um, in review of recent uh, 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 judicial decisions at the state level, um, that this is a 
that this, this is something that the board can approve by way of a, a section six determination, um, which as we typically do, uh, we use the uh, questions in section three, three for a special permit as the basis for that uh, review. Um, and we have determined that this is not a case that it has a, uh, this is not a, a large addition because the, uh, the portion of the addition that would take us over uh, the threshold is already included within the foundation of the building, um, that being the rear right corner um, of the building. So, um, so the findings that the board would need to make uh, is that the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit within the district. Um, this is an allowed use single family uh, home. Uh, why the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare, um, as this is stated by the applicant and by uh, some of their neighbors as well. Um, you know, houses, houses and families need to grow and expand with the times, and um, that this allows the family to uh, maintain this house um, and also maintain the historic character of the home. Um, the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. There are no changes to um, to traffic flow uh, as a result of this project. That will not overload any public system. It will not cause any substantial increase in the use of utilities. Requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the neighborhood. Um, the as the applicant has said at the start, they specifically hired um, an architect with experience in historic renovation to work with them on this project and they have gone before the historic board and received the approval of the historic commission um, that would well, is certainly uh, working very hard to maintain the character and integrity of the neighborhood. Uh, requested use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare, uh, will not cause an excess use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and then the, the determination at the, at the start, um, so the increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition. Um, and certainly, as, as Mr. Dupont said, this is an increase of a, a increase in, of eight and a half inches into the existing uh, setback, um, and it's up to the board to determine whether they feel that that is uh, substantially more detrimental. I would certainly concur with uh, the neighbors that that does not seem to rise to that level uh, even remotely. Um, should the board vote to approve, we have our three standard conditions, which were read into the record at the prior hearing. Um, so I will waive reading them a second time. Are there any additional um, conditions which any member of the board feels would be important to add? Um, I would note that you know they do have a permit from the historic commission. Um, there is no reason for the board to reference that in its decision. Hearing no further um, proposed conditions, would look for a motion. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. I move that the uh, board issue the section six finding on the basis of, excuse me, on the basis that the chair just outlined uh, and include the uh, three uh, typical conditions. Second. Thank you. Thank you. So the vote before the board is a motion to issue a section six uh, finding um, in regards to the application and attach the three conditions. Motion by Mr. Hanlon, seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, roll call vote of the voting members of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Chair votes aye. That is approved. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your patience this evening. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Then this brings us to.
back to our agenda. Item seven on our agenda docket number 37411, Pine Ridge Road. Um, so I could ask the applicants to go ahead and introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Good evening, thank you, Chair. I'm Matt Edwards, 11 Pine Ridge Road. Uh, thanks for sticking with us tonight. Um, we'll try to be efficient with time here. Uh, we have a uh, enclosed front porch that is uh, existing non-conforming structure. It's um, in the front setback. We'd like to make it wider um, and actually make it open uh, to be the full width of the house um, to give us a little bit more uh, outdoor recreation space and to improve a little bit of the um, the aesthetics of the house to, to be a little bit more inclusive of this existing uh, sort of second story addition that's uh, very old, if not original to the house. Um, so our, uh, our approach, our reading here is that we hope it's uh, substantially, not substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conforming structure. Um, and perhaps as a, a third hot potato for tonight, uh, but <laughs> I'll let you all be the judge. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share the drawings. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so this is the proposed plan with the extended porch, uh, which will propose to extend the full width of the house with the steps leading towards the front. Um, this is the proposed front elevation. Um, the open port, open covered porch here. The views from the two sides. And then, um, so this is the existing first floor plan with the enclosed porch here. So a few steps down to a landing, then it's a few additional steps. Um, and then up above it is a bedroom on the second floor. That's the existing condition again. And then we have um, rendering from the left side, the uphill side, uh, from the front corner, from the front, and from the downhill sides. And then this is the existing site plan. Um, so my under so is the so the existing enclosed porch. It's just being opened up and resupported. Correct. It's we're not changing the footprint on that side. That's correct, yes. Okay. Um, and so on this, obviously the side yard setbacks are plenty large. The front setback is the only one that's in question. Um, and it is an existing nonconformity and it is not actually getting any deeper. Um, it is being maintained at the same depth from the street. Uh, are there any I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Are there any questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. Um, I just wanted to ask a question of the applicant. Um, the So the existing um, enclosed portion of the second level, that's already that's already there, right? We're just, you're proposing to open up the porch beneath that. Uh, yeah, that's right. So we're contemplating no interior work. That's a yeah existing bedroom that's just not going to change. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and open. Um, before I open for public comment, I will just do, as the applicant has alluded to, this is another one of these circumstances where um, probably did not need to come before the board um, because there really isn't an increase in any existing nonconformity. Um, so we're not 100% sure why they're coming, why they were uh, referred to us, but uh, we will go ahead and, um, and complete the review. But as a part of that, we will have public comment. Uh, so if there are any members of the public who wish to address um, the board on this matter, you may raise your hand using the button on the participant tab. And if you're calling in, you may dial star nine. I will, I will wait for Mr. Moore to raise his hand. <laughs> wow. We don't have any big trees. So. <laughs> I can, I'm sure I can come up with a comment, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. 
you had a, you have a you have a great streak going. You know, I didn't want to I didn't want to step in the way. I warn you, I'm not going to include it in the opinion. <laughs> All right, seeing no no true public comment, we'll go ahead and close the public comment period on this hearing. Um, so as I sort of said, I'm a little, at a little bit of a loss on this one because quite honestly, there really isn't a determination that the board can make. Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, can I, can I comment on that or? Yes, please. Yeah, so we, we met with Rick Valorelli um, and okay. Colleen, they, they instructed us to come to you all. We didn't okay. formally apply for the permit, but um, we had informal discussions. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and so this is before us 539AB. So this is because there is a, it's an enclosed, it is a, an open porch um, that is within the front yard setback, uh, greater than 25 square feet. And so therefore it does uh, fall that portion of it, I guess, does fall under the jurisdiction of the board. So we will go ahead um, and proceed along those lines. Um, so the findings that the board would need to make in that regards. Uh, so it's initially it's the, the section 3.3 findings. Uh, so the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. So uh, single family use is allowed in the district and the porch within the front yard setback is allowable. Um, under 539A or B. Um, requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Um, this helps to create a more welcoming um, entrance to the house and um, is very much in keeping with the, the character of the house and the neighborhood. It won't, uh, the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair the pedestrian safety. There are no changes proposed to the driveway or anything that would impair any sight lines. Um, the requested use will not overload any public system. There are, this will not significantly impact any utilities. Uh, requested use will not impair the character and integrity of the neighborhood. Um, as we have said, this is a, a very attractive amenity to the house um, and is very much in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. Uh, requested use will not be detrimental to the public health or welfare. Uh, and the requested use will not cause an excess use detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, this is just, in, just uh, increasing the enjoyment of an existing single family house. Um, and, and I remember if there's a specific finding we need to make for 539. By law. Five three nine unenclosed. Yeah. So five three nine B unenclosed steps and decks and the like which do not project more than ten feet in the front yard or more than five feet in the side yard beyond the line of the foundation wall may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district in which the structure is built. Unenclosed steps, decks, and the like which do not project more than ten feet in the required rear yard. Um, and then part of follow back on the question of enclosed, which I know we had a, a discussion, enclosed entrance or vestibule. Um, a deck is a roofless outdoor space. So it is a porch. Um, it is not enclosed. And as such, So, so 539A, projecting eaves, chimneys, bay windows, balconies, open fire escapes, porches, and enclosed entrances, not more than 25 square feet in floor area, more than one story in high, which do not project more than three and one half feet beyond the line of the foundation wall may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided in the district in which the structure is built. Porches and enclosed entrances larger than that allowed above may extend into the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district by special permit. So there are no additional findings. It is just those. Um, initial findings under section 3.3. Mr. Chairman. Um, so should the 
board vote to approve this special permit application, uh, we would apply the standard three conditions, which were prior uh, read into the um, into the record. Uh, would also note that in the past, the board has issued um, conditions on applications like this, require uh, noting that the porch um, will not move the foundation wall of the house. Um, but that is now a part of the zoning bylaw itself under 539D. So that finding is no longer, uh, excuse me, that condition is no longer required. Are there any additional conditions which the board thinks would be appropriate for this application Mr. request? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Before we get there, um, I'm a little uncomfortable about the fact that we're not talking just about, this isn't really kind of matching up with our usual porch uh, because if we had treated this as a brand new thing and somebody was proposing a porch with a bedroom on top, uh, I'm not sure that the analysis that we just went through would fully, uh, would fully address the concerns we have there. And I, my, my sense is that it, it's in practice not a big deal in this particular case, but I wouldn't want to set a precedent that we, uh, without more thought than I've been able to give it as to what it means to approve the porch and then also the, the, the uh, also the level on side the porch. I'm not sure that uh, what is being proposed here is just the porch. Um, I was quite persuaded that it isn't really necessary to do this. The granting the special permit essentially takes a non-conforming situation and turns it into a conforming situation. Um, and that seemed to me to be a cleaner way to go about it since it's obviously true that there's no substantially increase, there's no substantial detriment to the, uh, to, to the neighborhood. Um, so I don't feel, in this case, it's hard to feel strongly about this one way or the other because of the peculiar nature in which it comes up. But I just wonder whether we, we have using this vehicle in a situation where the resulting structure is going to include both the porch and the, the room uh, on top of it, uh, what that would mean. I, I also don't understand what how that affects our, the usual determination about a foundation wall since it's not just the porch, it's a porch plus something else. Certainly. So the existing or the existing enclosed porch and second floor are an existing condition. So we're really in my in my view, we're not really considering that at all. We're what we're really doing is we're just infilling the porch between, you know, from that to the left side line of the house. Um and so it certainly can be taken as um, you know, this is a porch that is in front of the house but as you as you rightly say the building line is already possibly at the front <clears throat> excuse me the front of the porch um because of the second the two-story nature of the existing um the existing structure in which case all of this is behind the building line so none of it's in the setback um so i'm not sh sure you know so faced with a couple different decisions here as to how to how to view it um, I think you know, the board could take the take the determination that there really isn't a, an approval necessary, or the board can take the, the opinion that it's a porch on the front of the house that's extending into the required setback. Well, Mr. Chairman, especially in view of the hour, it, it, I don't want to debate too long on how to go about saying yes, but uh, <laughs> Maybe you could just make it clear the unusual situation of the case and emphasize that it's not precedential for other cases involving this kind of situation. Maybe that would be that would be best. Okay. Unless there's anything further from the board, I think we are ready for a motion. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I move that the uh, board approve the application for a special permit under section 539AB for the reasons that were stated and the, with the qualification stated by the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So 
vote of the voting members of the board. This is a motion to approve this special permit for 11 Pine Ridge Road with the three uh, conditions. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. The chair votes aye. We are approved on the special permit for 11 Pine Ridge Road. Congratulations. Thank you so much for staying up late with us. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. This brings us on our agenda back to item number two. Um, so number, this is the, the vote on the decision for 121 Park Avenue. Is Does the board feel prepared to vote on this tonight or do we want to postpone this till the next hearing? Has everyone had a chance to read it? I skimmed it. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, I did a very, very quick read. <laughs> Uh, do you feel prepared to vote for it this evening or should we postpone it? I'd be I, I'd be okay to vote on it personally, but okay. the first of the point. Me too. I it looked perfectly okay. fine. All right. Then with that, um, so what we have before us is the decision on 121 Park Avenue. This was written by Mr. Hanlon, uh, presented to the board for questions and comments. Are there any questions, are there any corrections that anyone wishes to make at this time? Nope. Seeing none, um, I will ask for, I would then move to accept the uh, the written decision for 121 Park Avenue. Can I have a second? Second. Okay, then a, um, a vote of the members who were present at that vote. Um, I believe I have the list correct. So that would be Mr. DuPont. Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So those minutes are approved. No, not minutes, excuse me. That decision is approved for 121 Park Avenue. Um, and that brings us up to item number three, uh, the annual election for chair and vice chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, so we typically do this at the first hearing in April. Um, and so I would ask if there are any motions, uh, not any motions, any nominations uh, for someone to serve as chair of the board. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I nominate Mr. Klein to serve and to continue to serve as uh, chair of the board. And I second if we need a second. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other nominations for the position of chair? Seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and take a vote of the board. So this is a motion to elect myself, Mr. Klein, Christian Klein, as chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, as moved by Mr. Hanlon and seconded by Mr. DuPont. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. Yeah, the chair votes aye. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your support. Um, at this time, we'll accept a nomination for the position of vice chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I would like to nominate Mr. Hamlin to continue to serve, if he's willing to do so. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Mr. Hanlon, do you accept? I do. I do. The chair will go ahead and second. So a vote of the board uh, to elect um, Patrick Hanlon to the position of vice chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. 
Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Congratulations, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Moore? I don't believe I heard Mr. Hanlon's vote. And if that is true, I believe I did hear uh, your vote for yourself. <laughs> How does that work? With that? I, I he did say it. it was very quiet, a little soft voice. Okay. I, I see. Thank you. <laughs> I've always been the soft spoken one. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that concludes the administrative items on tonight's agenda. Um, so review of upcoming meetings. Um, so we, our next meeting is Monday, April 17th at 7.30 p.m., which is the continuation of the comprehensive permit hearing for 1021-1025 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, again, we'll encourage everyone you have received uh, via email of a draft decision written by um, Paul Haverty, encourage you to review that. Uh, think of any questions you have, we're coming down to the last possible chances to enter uh, new information into the public record. Um, so if there's anything you would like to know at this phase, um, uh, please make sure uh, either uh, let myself know or um, or bring it with you to the meeting on the 17th. Um, then the next hearing after that will be Tuesday, April 25th at 7.30 p.m., which is um, we have four cases on that. Uh, we have one on Varnum Street, one on Oak Ledge, one on Teal, and one on Grandview. Um, and then the, as we had discussed at the very beginning of this meeting, uh, the following Tuesday, which will be May 2nd at 7.30 p.m., will be the opening meeting, uh, the opening hearing for the comprehensive permit hearing for 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, so that was May 2nd. And then, uh, Sunday, April 30th is the end of the review period for Mass Ave unless the 1021, 1025 Mass Ave unless it's extended. And then um, beyond that, we have a hearing, um, possible hearing on May 9th and May 23rd. Um, Colleen, do we have anything scheduled yet for those meetings? For May? From May 9 or May 23? Right now, I have four applications that came in this week okay I haven't set a, we haven't set a specific date okay. one guy thought at the beginning of may was too soon for them oh okay but. so i would note i am unavailable on may 9th but that does not mean that the board cannot meet with the under the guise of our very able vice chairs so how would we want to proceed with those? Um, with, Actually, so with Christian, the, two of them, yeah. two of them thought the ninth would be too soon for them, so that oh, okay. we might just push the whole thing right back, do all four of them at the later date. That works. Yeah, because we didn't we didn't continue anything tonight, so we're not under any particular pressure. We have other meetings where we can approve the decisions. So, yeah, if they're willing to all go on the twenty third, I think that's great. Okay, and I also have, I think, the rest of the minutes from the um, um, Mass Ave. Oh, yeah. Um, he sent them to me today, so I'll try and get them out to you guys tonight, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. And we should go ahead and just post those as well. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Colleen Ralston for her assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. And DuPont, vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Grigardelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. 
Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Good night, all. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Enjoy your weekends. We'll see you on Monday.